Hi everyone, thank you for joining our panel session. Uh, the new digitally conscious consumer and adapting your payments strategies to grow your business. Um, so I'm your host for this panel today. My name is Kobun Wang. I'm a senior analyst at Forrester Research. I cover digital marketing and e-commerce for Asia Pacific. So we have three panelists today. Um, so Ashley, Paulus, Zain Suhawardi, and Atul Shivani. So I will pass through um, each of you to let you introduce yourself to the audience. Let's start with Ashley. Ashley, over to you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so my name is Ashley Paulus, and I'm based here in Singapore, and I'm the Senior Customer Success Manager for Checkout.com, which is a leading international provider of online payment solutions. So prior to joining Checkout, I worked with e-commerce and subscription model businesses around the world. So I'm very keenly aware of what it takes to get a product out into the market, um, to get a customer to the Checkout page, and now the power of having a really good payment solution and what that can offer a business. Checkout.com has a, a really big vision for the payments industry, and we're striving to be as transparent, efficient, and accessible as possible, um, all of which play really strongly into our conversation today. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I will pass it to uh, Zeng. Zeng, over to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zain Sovarwadi. I'm the head of e-commerce, uh, head of uh, e-commerce for Singapore Post. So Singapore Post e-commerce is a business unit uh, which provides end-to-end e-commerce enablement for brands and SMEs across Southeast Asia. So we manage pretty much everything for e-commerce with regards to commercial strategy, marketing, uh, warehousing operations, and the other store ops functions which are needed to keep e-commerce running. Uh, prior to uh, my current role, I've spent a bit of time in a digital transformation role in private equity. And prior to that, was part of the founding team for Zalora and uh, prior uh, with Lazada uh, pre and post Alibaba's acquisition. Thank you, Zeng. Last but not least, Atul. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I'll keep it uh, short. I don't have as much experience as these guys have uh, in the panel, but I uh, have been working in retail for the past seven years. Uh, before that, I was a technocrat. I was building products for uh, Wipro Technologies uh, for clients like Shell, uh, BP, uh, Philips, uh, and uh, switched to retail uh, sometime during my uh, uh, entrepreneurship phase and uh, figured out that retail is the uh, is where uh, you know my heart is and uh, it's been a whirlwind journey of seven years where i first worked with a footwear retailer and now i work with the biggest beauty uh, brand at least in the south asian region um, uh, and have been uh, leading uh, the business from uh, developing it developing the business from a d2c perspective and also uh, selling on third party market basis Great, thank you, Atu. So we have um, we have speakers from from vendors, and then we have speakers from retailers. That's great. So we all know 2020 is a very special year uh, because of the COVID-19, and um, that actually fundamentally changed how consumers think, behave, and consume. And across Asia Pacific, and even across the world, we see consumers actually purchase more products online. And actually, for a lot of products, they usually don't purchase online, such as luxury goods or groceries. Now they start to purchase online. And also, their expectations to brands or retailers actually has changed as well. Um, so in the past, they shop online, probably want to save time. It's more convenient. But right now, it's also because shopping online, it's, it's, it's safer. Um, so their expectations is about the balance of convenience and the safety. Of course, there are a lot of things for retailers and their partners to consider, including like how to make the transaction or checkout uh, process much smoother, how to uh, make the logistics um, more efficient, and how to make the user experience more smooth. So there are a lot of um, things to consider and 
to ensure the entire end-to-end um, -end online uh, shopping experience. And the result is also quite obvious. So we compare consumers across the world. If we compare different countries where e-commerce um, is at different levels of maturity. We see in more mature countries, such as uh, in China, where uh, e-commerce is more mature, 60% of consumers said that they want to purchase more products online because of COVID-19. But only 40% of consumers in the US are willing to do so because they felt purchasing online is still quite frustrated for them. So they would rather go back to shop offline. Um, so that's what we see, right? So as, as a retailer or as, as a uh, partner, and then it's not just moving business online, but also to ensure the end-to-end -end smooth uh, online shopping experience. And there are many things to consider, um, including, so that's, uh, that's passed to our first panelist, Ashley, because you are from a payment company. So from payment perspective, using um, payment is not help uh, customers to compete in online transaction, but also you can access to quite rich customer data. Uh, so from your perspective, how companies should do this and how payment can help them? Thank yeah, you, so yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I think when we talk about e-commerce, there's two different types of data that we can look at. So there's the data and customer data that a merchant sees, which is going to be how long are your customers spending on your page? What products are they looking at? What are they putting in their cart? Um, and then there's the payment data. And that's the part that uh, Checkout really looks at a lot. And that's the part that we have the most access to. So we know that a cash transaction isn't going to give you as many data points around your customer as an online payment would. But data in and of itself is not super helpful. You have to be able to turn that data into really actionable insights. And we're seeing our existing merchants do that in two ways. The first is by informing their operational strategy. So for a really simple example, with digital payment data that you, you get around um, the customer's way to pay, you're going to know where your customers are coming from. What country are they coming from? That's a great data point. But with this information alone, you can start to analyze um, what are the current payment methods that you're offering on your website? Should you, if a majority of your customers are coming from uh, Indonesia, for example, should you start to offer GoPay as a local payment method? Um, where are your marketing dollars going? Are your marketing dollars giving you the most return on investment? If the majority of your customers are coming from Thailand, are you doing strategic marketing in Thailand? Um, are there any other addressable markets that you guys should be looking at? Um, and lastly, what are potential cost savings that you could see as a business for entering into a new market? So when you're, um, when you're going global and you're starting to acquire customers that are, we would call that cross-border, so you're maybe a Singapore domiciled business and you're acquiring customers in, in Indonesia, for example, um, it's going to be much cheaper to acquire for customers that have Singaporean banks than it would be for Indonesian banks, for example. Um, so you can look at your overall strategy and see, you know, do my my five or 10 year expansion plans really align with where my customers are? And is there potential cost savings from a payment perspective if I were to, you know, let's say open an entity in that new market? Um, the second way that we're seeing customers really harness their payments data is by using it to increase revenue or explore new revenue streams. So a really simple example would be you have customers who are using credit cards and customers who are using debit cards. So if you are using a stored card file um, on your website, so your customers aren't having to enter their information every time they come onto your website and they want to make a purchase, um, you'd be able to see, okay, this is the cohort for credit, this is the cohort for debit. So maybe if you knew for those credit customers, you knew that their transactions were, were really smooth, they weren't having any, um, any decline transactions, they're really trusted customers, they're obviously not having any troubles with insufficient funds, maybe you want to promote um, maybe more expensive products to them, or maybe you want to send them notifications for uh, specific VIP shopping experiences. So there are ways that you can kind of maximize on that payments data. Um, you could ask, you know, do we want to give our good customers um, credit terms within our site, which is an initial revenue stream. Um, and then also by knowing, using your payments data to know um, which banks and which cards are your customers using, you can identify new business opportunities um, such as tie-ups or promotions um, or strategic partnerships that you could do with those different issuing banks. So um, I think that 
again, there, I can only speak on, you know, the payments data that you're receiving, but by pairing that with the customer data that um, our e-commerce sites and platforms are seeing, there's some really interesting and, you know, robust things that you can do. Thank you, Ashley. So before I pass the same question to Zane, let's launch our first poll so the audience can also answer this question and then we will see the result. Um, then Zane, what, what do you think about how to leverage uh, payment uh, data and uh, how to ensure that can re enrich your customer insights to empower better online shopping experience? So it's totally aligned with, uh, with Ashley in terms of the overall benefits of data and uh, of obviously online payments. I guess from a globalization perspective, if you're looking at cross-border selling, uh, it's, it's very, very crucial to make sure that the payment aspects are clear. Uh, obviously, if you're looking at, uh, you know, you're a Singapore merchant, for example, and you want to sell in Indonesia or Thailand, uh, you would need to collect the money from the customer prior. Uh, considering that, you know, one of the other statistics that we've seen in e-commerce uh, as it's grown, as it's grown is that the doorstep rejection rates or the cancellation rates for prepaid orders versus cash on delivery is drastically different. So on prepaid orders, you could see close to 95% uh, acceptance rate or, or completion rate, while on COD, the cancellation rate can go as high as 60%. And, and that, that, you know, it's not, you know, it, it adds to a lot of your costs because, uh, you know, from an operational perspective for a retailer, and Atul could sort of, you know, verify that is that uh, one of the bigger costs of e-commerce is operations, your warehousing, your picking, your packing, and your shipping. Now, after you've put in all those costs and you get your product to a customer and the customer says, hey, yeah, I bought it at that point, I had money, but you know what, I went for dinner yesterday and I spent it. So I don't have cash right now. And and they would cancel it, right? So I think those are the, the keys to, to being able to, to you know, prepay versus uh, versus uh, the COD model. Uh, I think the other thing is uh, from a business perspective, the the credit uh, and the cash flow help that you get, right? If you do a COD versus uh, prepay, prepayment, you use a, you use a proper uh, payment checkout and you use credit cards or major debit cards, you get your money almost instantaneously. While with COD, depending on the, the 3PL that you're working for, it could take up to 15, 20 days to get your money back. And I think that's a big thing when it comes to liquidity and when you're growing your e-commerce business and you know the additional accounting and finance and chasing that you have to do. Uh, data, again, uh, at, at every aspect of e-commerce, there is data. And e-commerce is a fairly data-driven business from the time a customer comes on to how they browse, to how they click through. And you know, as you look at your entire checkout funnel, what are the areas that people are dropping off? And there's different strategies at different parts. Uh, but I would assume, you know, in, in a holistic part, the UX becomes an important part, but payments is important. And specifically from an aspect of a cross-border, right? Uh, if you want to go, as Ashley said, into Indonesia or Thailand, you need to look at what those markets are doing. Uh, Thailand and Indonesia are also good examples because these are predominantly cash economies versus uh, Malaysia or Singapore, which are predominantly digital. But but you still have, when you use a payment gateway, you still have aspects of using local wallets where people might not have bank accounts, but they might have digital wallets and you can still use a good payment aggregator to be able to improve the conversion journey. And then there's aspects of campaigns and, you know, getting the, the new fintechs coming in the market to utilize their cash to, you know, get more conversion and more bang for your dollar per se on the ROI. That, that's that's about all I, I want to put in that, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Zeng. Um, there's a bit of uh, breaking up from the site, um, but that's okay. Um, and um, so we got the poll result here, um, and it seems that 25% of our audience, they think their payments platforms tell them everything they need to know. Um, but about 60% said they got a decent amount of data, but couldn't, uh, but could be getting more, which means um, there are still insights they want to know. And there are, of course, a, a lot more things to do from retailer, from payment partners, like 
Um, and I want to ask Atul, which option did you select and why? Probably you can comment a little bit from a retailer's perspective. Atul, are you there? So, <clears throat> yes, yes, I'm here. I'm glad you asked because uh, I'm with the majority here. Uh, and I think uh, when when we heard when I heard about this question, I was thinking, you know, uh, I probably have this data already from a transaction data bank, right? So why do I need this uh, data separately? Um, I uh, cannot from, hear you at uh, all. From, uh, hi. Can everyone uh, else hear? I don't know. Okay. Okay, we lost Ashley and. Uh, 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 we can we can hear you. We can hear him. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me try again and be a little louder. Sorry about that. I see Ashley is back. Zeng is back. Let's wait for a bit for a tool. Yeah. Sorry about the clunky experience. Yeah. That. that. That's part and parcel of the post pandemic. At least you know it's live, right? Yes. So as I was saying, I'm glad you asked me this question. I'm with the Okay, so here, that, that's fine. So while we are waiting for Atul to come back to comment on the first question, probably I will start with the next follow up question. Um, so payment can generate rich customer data, um, but um, the awareness of consumer data privacy is actually increasing and the regulations as well. Um, so it's very important to ensure um, consumer data privacy and customers, they also have the concern, right? While they are using um, payment services, can they ensure the safety of the data? How can you handle um, questions, uh, issues like um, identity fraud? Um, so I will, I, I see Atul is back. Atul, can you hear me? Okay, doesn't seem so. Okay, sorry, um, let's go back to Ashley. Um, so how can you help your customers for the questions like um, fraud and data privacy? Yeah, um, so, uh, obviously, fraud is like one of the, the biggest concerns that consumers are having now that we have this kind of mass migration online. And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet, right? There's nothing that you can do to make sure that all of your revenue is coming in is um, completely fraud free. Um, but there are a few steps that you can take to kind of protect yourself and your revenue against bad actors. So we recommend kind of a a layered approach, um, really depending on the merchant and of course, their risk tolerance. So the first is going to be 3D secure. Um, 3D Secure is a challenge, and this is going to offer you, as a merchant, liability shift. So when a customer enters in their card details for their transaction, there's a, a kind of background process that happens. And so the payments provider asks the issuing bank um, to verify this information, and the customers then sent a challenge. This could be an OTP, a face scan, a thumbprint, something to verify that, yes, indeed, this is the actual customer. Um, if this is successful, the issuer says, yes, we trust that, you know, this is actually um, Ashley who's making this purchase online. You can go ahead and there's a liability shift. So as far as friendly fraud, if there's, you know, future fraud, future chargeback instances that arise, then you as the merchant are not liable for that. Um, but this isn't a foolproof system, right? Um, not all cards, not all banks are enabled for um, 3D secure. And while this can protect you from friendly fraud, um, if you've already sent the goods, um, if you have a lot of high valued items, then you would be out of your of your stock as well. So a second rule that you can put in are well, a second system that you can use are our static rules around transactions. So you can um, based on your processing data, you can say, OK, we want to ensure that all transactions that are coming from countries that we deem as high risk are going through a 3D secure process, or we wanna ask additional information from these customers to verify that it truly is them. Uh, you can set static velocity rules that say, okay, you know, we know from our payments data that on average we have um, customers make two transactions a week. Um, so anything outside of two transactions a week, maybe five transactions a week, um, we wanna flag those transactions and we wanna review them before we, we actually capture them. 
Um, and lastly, we we ask our merchants to really um, look at the entire customer journey um, prior to the payment experience. So as, a, as the e-commerce merchant, as the platform, you know best um, whether your customer is trusted, whether you're comfortable shipping them high value goods. Is this in line with their historical spending behavior? Um, you can say this is um, an existing or you know whitelisted, very trusted customer. I don't need to put them through a specific 3D secure flow. So um, there's a few different things that you can do uh, that help to, again, keep your, your revenue um, safe while, again, maximizing um, the amount of that safe revenue that you're able to get. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, it's very important for consumers because they want to give the data to e-commerce players, to their partners, then they want to be sure um, they can trust these partners. And also, there's a value exchange, right? So consumers give the data to you and they expect to get a better services or, or a more efficient um, transaction or um, better, faster delivery, etc. And yep. um, I will I will pass to yes. So Atu is back. Atu, if you can hear me, let me take a pause here and go back to our first question. And um, so I'm really curious to know, like from a retailer's perspective, which which option did you choose and why? All right. Uh, I'm just gonna do a mic test here. Is, am I audible? I hope it will work this time. <laughs> uh. So I'm, I'm audible to everyone, but- uh, Yes, I can so hear you briefly and then talk to you again. Yes, yes, now I can hear All you. All right. Uh, okay, that's great, that's great. Hi, uh, So I'm just gonna- Great, uh, I'm awesome. just gonna start speaking and if it breaks, it breaks. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm glad you asked me that question because I am in the majority You're the majority, so you chose B. Okay, we lost Otto again. Yeah. So All right, let but me, uh, doing now he chose B and he goes with the majority. Um, I'm just saying, as in from a retailer perspective, maybe I can add a bit of things. Yes, uh, Zeng, please. So, so yeah, just just from the retailer's shoes uh, while we wait for Atul, I think uh, the part where you say we get enough data, but we could get more, I think usually what retailers do and when we look at data uh, from a payment perspective, right? So it's again, it, it all goes back to the conversion funnel. So you get traffic, traffic browses, traffic adds something to cart, and then they go to checkout. And then the biggest dilemma that we have is why do X amount of people come do all the effort of putting things into cart and then they end up dropping off instead of paying for that product? So, so I think the sort of data that usually retailers are trying to look at from a payment gateway is, you know, when a, when a customer made the effort of coming to a checkout, why did they drop? Was it because they didn't have enough funds in their card? Was it because of a shipping fee element which came in? Was it because the the, 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 the payment processor, you know, pop-up window did not come in. So I think it, it's more micro data that, that brands are trying to get to because, you know, they say, oh, 100K people came in, 500 people eventually went to check out and of the 500 people, only 100 people checked out. So then they're like, where did the 400 go and why did they drop off? When you usually ask a payment gateway to share that data with you, they will put it into very generic buckets. So I think it's like an L1 bucket, but brands want to see like an L3, you know, really, really pinpoint why. And then how what can we do to sort of fix that? Um, and I think it's it's one of those things where a bit of hypothesis needs to be applied and a bit of, uh, uh, you know, pr uh, discussions with your payment gateway partner where they would be able to put it together. The the best way to verify this eventually then comes in with A-B testing to, to sort of change certain things and, you know, and then divide your audiences into, let's say, 50-50 and then, you know, do a test around 30 days or 40 days, depending on whatever, to see with those small changes in checkout that you've made, does it make an impact to your conversion? 
And eventually, is the payment gateway at fault, or is it your UX journey, or you're asking for too much information? With the customers, just like I don't want to fill all this because ninety percent of the consumers you need to make, you know, you need to understand are on their mobile phones. So if you ask them for everything, mm-hmm. including the history of their parents, they would just drop off because they wouldn't have time. So it's about how seamless can you make the checkout process? Uh, how much data you ask? So you know, when you're checking out with an order, you just need their name and address and maybe their phone number, but you don't need their date of birth. You don't need other information, which generally people tend to ask for. So it's just, you know some of those things uh, which which tend to be more of a A/B test hypothesis. Uh, you know we've been doing this for a long time, but I can't say that there is a certain formula to success. There is you know for every brand, there's a certain journey they need to go through. Yeah, there's almost like a sweet spot between asking just enough information and like asking um, too much information, where customers are like, I I have no interest in doing this. Um, at all, we actually at checkout we have like 150 different response codes, so it's really interesting to see one like what what is the feedback from the issuer, um, because in the end of in the end of the day the responses are actually coming back from the issuer, and then we call it um, an art not a science. So it's about really like finessing that information and just as you mentioned, um, building hypotheses and then um, testing and seeing what makes sense. Yeah. And, and yeah, and to test that, you need to maybe change a bit of your UI UX stuff. You need to, you yeah. know, play around free shipping mechanics and a few other right. things. That Thank you, Zeng and Ashley. Um, I think Zeng is frozen from my side. He's okay from my side. Okay, right. Yeah. So probably my connection is sure. I'm so sorry about this. Um, we can hear you fine now, though. Yeah. Same. So, how? So, in your experience, how did you help retailers or brands um, for the anti-fraud issue? Sorry, for which issue? For the payments fraud issue as well. Ashley, could could you hear? I could not. Zane, I guess um, I guess I'm you see. I know. Let's let's just talk. Um, I mean, you see fraud from like a totally different perspective, right? Have you seen like a a big increase in fraudulent transactions, or um, like what have you guys seen with with your customers? So I think fraud in general, when you talk about Southeast Asia, it hasn't been that big a problem per se. Uh, yeah. We've had it right. So during the COVID time and during the lockdown time, we did have. Uh, phishing exercises. We did have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, server attacks on on the websites that we manage, and and as a result of that, you know, it, it affects the entire flow of how the website was performing, the entire flow of being able to add to cart and check out, and eventually to a payments gateway aspect as well. But I think uh, generalistically, you know, a lot of our clients that are that are today, you know, they use uh, top tier payment gateways uh, such as checkout. And, 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 you know, as a result of that, you know, that fraud element is, is not really something which we've uh, faced, but we have conditions and we have rules. So for example, Singapore, Malaysia, we're a bit more lenient, but when it comes to Indonesia and Thailand, we have a little bit more rules. So as you mentioned, we have customer yeah. profiling. If a customer comes in for the first time and we say, hey, the average order value of the, this, this brand is not more than 100 US, and why is this mm-hmm. guy buying, let's say 150 or 180? So we have flags. And then we have a payment fraud team which verifies these. If need be, we get in touch with the customer to verify whether they place that order and, and so on and so forth. And then we maintain this database on you know a CRM uh, platform. So, so if Zan comes in today, buys $150, I get a call, I verify, it gets, it gets delivered. Three, three weeks later, if I place a $500 order, they'll call me again. But post that, if that goes through, if maybe a month later I place a $600 order, it will go through uh, without me getting a call because I'm already a verified user. So, so there are different rules. Again, the rules are something that we as a service provider recommend to our clients, and then it's to the clients. There are certain clients that we have today who say that we have a Singapore website, and we do not want to accept any credit card payments outside of Singapore. Yeah. Uh, there are others who, as you mentioned, Ashley, would say that high-risk countries are countries that we don't want uh, you know, credit cards to be coming in from. So those could be a few developing Asian countries where they, they've locked them out. 
Um, and uh, and yeah, it's just something that they take a categorical decision that it could impact their potential revenue, but they say, you know, we, we'd rather be safer than sorry. But, but all in all, uh, you know, we haven't really faced many problems with regards to fraud. Uh, mm -hmm. Often or still do happen, and that's where we need to relook at the conditions and the boundary conditions and the manual checks that we need to implement uh, as part of the flagging mechanism. Are you guys using AI at all? We aren't. No, so when no. AI for payments, or do you say? Uh, just for, I guess, like the machine, not, maybe not even AI, but just like um, the machine learning aspect of, um, you know, advanced like behavior um, evaluation and just kind of setting, you know, just as we're saying like static rules, um, but you mentioned you're able to say, oh, okay, a customer's made this transaction two or three times. So now it's, you know, he or she is a trusted customer. Um, I was just wondering if that's how you guys were, were coming to those metrics, because that's very interesting. So we're, we're, to be honest, we're, we're using, we use about three or four payment gateways. Uh, yeah. We work with their product and, and the sort of rules that they roll out. So as they roll out new, features in their product, they keep us up to speed with it. Um, mm -hmm. And then we look at it from a perspective of uh, which customers of ours and which geography could benefit out of that. Uh, we're not uh, we're not part of the building product aspect, so we're not payment mm -hmm. experts, I would put it, uh, but, but we do face the day-to-day -day challenges which we discussed with our payment partners uh, to yeah. see if they are working on a solution or they already have a solution which they could you know advise our team in terms of implementation. Yeah, that's awesome. Great, great. Thank you, Zeng. Thank you, Ashley. So let's move to the next question is about uh, online shopping customers. Do we know the next question? <laughs> Do we? Should we just go for it? Um, I think the, the next question are, what are the must-haves when it comes to e-commerce user experience? And what are digitally conscious customers um, expecting from your store? I think that you are, um, you're best equipped for, for this guy. So I think it's, again, one of those things, right, where there's no one right answer. Uh, but, but, you know, there are certain must-haves. Let's, let's put it that way, right? Uh, you know, we, we spoke about one of the must-haves where, you know, in your checkout process, make it as seamless as possible. May, you know, mm -hmm. have checkout as an option, have as many payment providers in a certain country as possible so that there is no particular, uh, you know, aspect which should tell a customer, oh, this is too confusing or this is too too much work for me to check out. So make it as seamless as possible. When it comes to product cataloging, right, that's also super important. So the big difference mm -hmm. between an e-commerce store versus walking into a store is there is no physical person or no physical merchandiser to guide you. So everything that you put on your store needs to speak for itself, whether it's the picture of the product, whether it's the USPs of the product, uh, whether it is the, you know, whether it's a 100 ml bottle or a 500 ml bottle, whether it's for dry skin or for oily skin, uh, you know, the, all those features benefits need to be there in the PDP or the product display page with the content so that as a consumer, you get what you're looking for. If you're selling apparels, the size charts need to be exact. Uh, if you're selling skin care, you know, all the key, you know, things that you need to know if you're selling vitamins, different examples, everyone knows their industry best. Uh, but one thing that we need to understand is we need to tell the customer everything in that one page while making it dynamic, while making it not too yeah. wordy, uh, because there is no one over there to answer their questions. Live chat is, is a new feature that, you know, marketplaces have been trying out and we see a lot of traction on that. Uh, and I think it's an interesting feature to have. It's like a concierge on your website where you say, hey, I'm looking at this t-shirt. Uh, I want to know what the material is or, you know, uh, does it run small? Does it run big? Product reviews are, are very, very important. And, and when you have thousands of products on your website, uh, categorizing them correctly and having the right filters yes. is important to be able to, so if you're in apparels and you're looking for a white t-shirt, then you should be able to get to a white t-shirt, right? Your search bar should be optimize and you know all of those you know these are hygiene factors which you need to take into account uh, because the consumer today is very jumpy they don't have time they just want to come look for a white top you type in white top and if you see black they're like okay these guys are you know let's just move on yeah. so, so yeah. <laughs> for sure 
Atul, I know you want to jump in. I have. Uh, thank you, Zen. You're my hero. Uh, you've been, uh, you know, answering for on behalf of all of us. So thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> And yes, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, uh, I'm audible now to uh, both you and uh, uh, the panel. So, yes, uh, thank you for uh, letting me answer this question this this time. Uh, so, I think uh, the basic hygiene factors that uh, Zen mentioned. I mean, these are these are these come across as obvious, right? These come across as okay. There should be enough information for a consumer on the PDP. But you will be surprised if you look around. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk about the Amazons and the uh, Lazadas of the world, but if you look around a step below, uh, even, even those guys are missing the basic hygiene features, a, a great search, for example. Uh, why should it be only an Amazon's domain, right? Why should uh, we not offer as a retailer of a great search? Because uh, if, if you think about it, uh, and if you if you look at just, I mean, there's no thinking about it. If you look at the data, people who start their purchase journey with a search, are seven times more likely to convert on your website. So if if you have if you don't have a great search on your website, then you're probably uh, you know uh, uh, sacrificing on your conversion rate. Uh, the the entire e-commerce uh, experience. I mean, if you, we we have to break it down into three steps because it's it's a problem too large to address at one time. Uh, it's 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 a it's a pre-purchase problem. It's a at the time of purchase issue and then it's obviously a post purchase experience and we are uh, uh, even though we've had an advantage in the post pandemic world where people have had no option uh, but to shop online uh, we can't take that advantage for granted we have to uh, make sure that these people keep coming back uh, because they've had a great experience the first time so i guess that the, the challenge in front of us is you know uh, first of all figure out the hygiene and that's that's uh, that's I mean, it's surprisingly missing in the industry right now. Uh, if, if you if you uh, if you had a list of uh, twelve items that are considered as hygiene, you would find maybe six or seven covered by most retailers. Uh, and then uh, the the key part is uh, definitely a seamless checkout experience. Uh, it's it's now you've gotten the customer. Now you've gotten hooked. The fish is reeled in. Uh, he's willing to make a purchase if at that point if you are asking too many questions and making it too difficult uh, for for the uh, customer to complete complete his or her purchase then uh, uh, we'll we're again sacrificing conversion rate uh, number of options of payments uh, of course uh, uh, guest checkout is something that you know uh, you, you you'll be surprised how many of the retailers you'll have to explain this to that why guest checkout is uh, uh, this is extremely important uh, and and uh, you know <clears throat> uh, using the modern uh, pay payment methods like upi in india, uh, for example in india uh, upi is uh, so widely adopted there are more than uh, uh, 2 billion transactions that happen in uh, uh, on upi uh, every every month and yet uh, about only 20% of uh, online players offer upi as a payment method uh, so so you you to sort of you know you to sort of keep up with the times because uh that the millennial consumer is moving from one wallet to the other one payment method to the other uh and and we have to we have to offer all the options possible and then last but not the least you've got the customer now uh you now we have to get the extreme i mean the maximum possible customer lifetime value out of it uh the cat's out of the bag he's placed the order that's where that's where you know you differentiate yourself that's when you sort of you know let uh, the uh, how fast and how uh, communicative you are in the post purchase experience uh, will set you apart uh, it's very difficult for a, a single brand or a small player to manage that but there are ecosystems that are developed uh, already where you can latch on to an existing large ecosystem and take uh, advantage of that uh, Doing it all in-house would be would be uh, crazy. So uh, post-purchase experience, you give it to the best, but you make sure that you're looking at every step of the journey. Uh, and uh, underlying all of this uh, is seeking feedback at every stage. Uh, you don't know what your customer wants till you ask them uh, and ask them in the simplest possible uh, manner. Uh, 
uh, you might make assumptions. Uh, you might think you know better than your customer does, but you don't. So seek feedback at every every step of the way. Ask feedback on PDB. Ask feedback on checkout. Ask feedback on delivery experience. Check. Uh, you know. So so the more data points you have, or the more voice of the customer you have, the more you uh, more you learn, and the more you are able to sort of you know make changes on the fly. Uh, so so that's that's sort of you know uh, would be my sort of input to this uh, question this is a too large a question to address it here right now so one more thing i would like to just add in here atul's covered pretty much everything the one aspect that a lot of brands and a lot of retailers tend to miss is operations warehousing uh, yeah. the ability to pick and pack and ship it in time and the ability to make sure that you are monitoring each and every aspect of the product reaching the customer uh, you know, in today's e-commerce world, it is easier to sell than to fulfill. And the reason is every, you know, Indonesia is a nightmare when it comes to the last mile logistics because of the geography. Philippines is another interesting story where, you know, they don't believe in PO boxes. So the last mile delivery channel and prior to that, that fulfillment becomes. So when a customer places the order and they get an email, thank you for your order, your order number is this, they expect to reach it to them ASAP. Now, whether you can do it in two days, three days or 15 will set you apart in terms of whether they would come to you again or not. So a lot of times what I feel when I talk to brands is they concentrate on the front end part, but they don't concentrate on the back end part, which is operations, which is making sure that you have a seamless order management system. You are, you know, putting in accurate inventory onto your website so that, you know, you don't oversell or you don't have issues where you need to call the customer and say, hey, sorry, we're out of stock. And, you know, all the other CX repercussions that come in. Uh, and again, as Atul mentioned, there are ecosystems available for that. Uh, there are B2C warehousing experts and to end warehousing experts. There are something that we do as well, per se. But, but it's a very important metric. Operations, getting the product to the customer is the biggest uh, competitive advantage that you could have against your brands uh, by being able to do that. Uh, during the COVID lockdown time, there were certain big brands which were taking close to one month to deliver an order. In a, you know, in a city like Singapore or Malaysia. And that's just not acceptable. Uh, when you can get food in two hours, you can't wait 30 days for a product. Yeah, that's exactly true. So basically, Atul and Zeng mentioned the two parts of the online shopping experience. One is really the customer facing side. How good is your user experience? And you have to ask step, of, uh, all, all, step by step all the way about uh, customers' feedback, how they feel about the experience. While well, Zane mentioned, there's heavy lifting part in the back end as well. So unless you can deliver the uh, agility of logistics, supply chain fulfillment, um, and then you can deliver the good shopping experience to your customers. And to be honest, customers today are truly channel agnostic. They don't care whether it's uh, under brands perspective to take care of this or its partners or even it's like last mile delivery service they don't care they purchase something from the brand they will consider that's a part of the experience they want to get uh, so before i move to the next question i want to check our audience so let's launch our second poll uh, where do do you see um the biggest holes on your online customer experience strategy Yes, and then while we, we are waiting for the result of the poll, I'd like to ask Ashley, right? So you guys have the great data to show um, the co positive correlation between like the smooth checkout experience or user experience and the um, the, the GMV or, or the, the transaction data. Um, so can you talk more about this? Yeah, of course. So um, I, I guess I kind of sit in the middle of, of Zane and Atul here. So there's, again, like the, the customer experience um, through the process of the checkout. There's the logistics and, you know, kind of that back end piece. Um, but as far as expectations from a payment perspective, uh, the th things that we I mean, it's it's kind of been touched on here in this conversation as well. So your customer wants a native experience um, as far as their payment. They're of course, you're going to see more cart abandonment if they're going to be redirected to a third party site. Um, they're also going to want your payment frame to match and have the same look and feel as um, the website. 
uh, checkouts brand colors are, um, you know, blue, yellow, and green, that obviously wouldn't work on a Lazada website, for example. So everything needs to be um, very native, very natural. And then from a business perspective, of course, you need to, you know, kind of meet the customers where they are with, um, you know, a local payment um, strategy. And then lastly, the, the security is obviously going to be the biggest one for, for customers as well. Um, I think that now um, more than ever, we've had this you know, big, big shift into digital and customers have such um, high expectations of how their data is stored. Um, they're very mindful of what information they're um, inputting into, into sites and how that information is being used. So I think from a merchant perspective, um, customers definitely are, are going to demand a very uh, robust um, strategy and security settings from from their online platform. Great, thank you, Ashley. So we got the result. Well, it seems payment and checkout isn't the bottleneck here. Uh, it's more about the heavy lifting logistics and the delivery part, as well as the store optimization and communication. Um, well, that's that's basically aligned with our expectations, right? So customer facing uh, digital experience is a lot easier, but um, the challenge lies in the back end. We don't see those challenges takes much longer time and takes um, uh, more investment for retailers and partners. So overall, it's an ecosystem and no matter brands, retailers, partners, technology providers, they have to work together. Um, and then that's the foundation to provide a seamless online shopping experience to customers. And another trend we see because of COVID-19, uh, consumers cannot travel internationally anymore. So that actually provides an opportunity uh, for the boon of uh, cross-border e-commerce because they cannot travel physically, but um, there are products they want to buy from providers from different countries and cross-border e-commerce. That's that's basically their best alternative option. Um, and uh, I will start with um, Zane. Um, how how do you see the opportunity of cross-border e-commerce and what retailers and brands should do to take this opportunity? to better engage with the customers and the grow business? So I think you've rightly put it, cross-border has, has always been a key aspect. Uh, you know, there was an interesting study the other day about, you know, you, we've seen, we've heard about, uh, you know, one after the other major retailer closing down or departmental store rather closing down. So we had Robinson's, which closed down in Singapore recently and Malaysia as well. And then we hear about other if you think if you look back and think back in the day what was the key usp of a department store they carried brands which were not available anywhere else in the country they brought in international foreign brands and they kept them there and you had to go to a harrods or you had to go to a robinsons to get access to those brands but in today's world with every each and every of that brand having their own brand.com you order from the us you get it delivered in three days to singapore or to any part of the world that you're sitting in so the dynamics have changed. Uh, people can get to the product, and and China has built a great model on cross border uh, because you know almost 80, 90 percent of the world's products are manufactured in China. Uh, but in the COVID, we saw some interesting facts as well, right? So in Singapore, there are certain predominantly Singaporean brands. Uh, a lot of them are to do with you know muscle pain balms and you know some of the food stuff that you get in Singapore or in Malaysia or Indonesia, and because of these countries being tourist hubs or business hubs, you had people flying in from Australia, from the UK, from the US. Now they can't come here, but they still have a demand for those products. And then you know this this uh, this you know speed came in where we want to get those products to the consumers wherever they're sitting. That meant they needed to have their websites up and running. They needed to have good payment gateways which could accept payments globally. Uh, and then the last and most important part is having the right logistics partner who can pick up their parcel in the country of origin and have it shipped to the country via live tracking, being able to giving the supplier and the buyer both real-time visibility on getting that and the surety of making sure that the parcel doesn't get stuck in customs or there's no additional duty on it and all of those above, right? So, uh, so CrossPort has definitely become more interesting in the past couple uh, months specifically. Uh, you have the likes of Lazada and Shopee, which have 
have started to do a lot of cross border and there are certain categories like fashion sports uh, home and living which are predominantly uh, more cross border than local selling uh, but uh, but i think there are boundary conditions when it comes to you selling through those platforms but as a dot com if you have your own brand dot com nothing is stopping you from selling anywhere but again the hygiene factors are there which is generalistically whether you sell locally or internationally but payments become a very very key proponent over here right because you need to have the right payment partner to be able to process payments and you need to have the right logistics partner to get those products to your consumers and making sure that they don't get lost or they're trackable and the delivery commitment that you've made to your consumer if you say we will deliver this to you in 10 days or 5 days we need to deliver it within that time uh if we breach that that leads to negative nps that leads to them potentially not coming back and buying from you again yeah exactly reason thank you so much so i will pass to ashley right from payment perspectives what are the new opportunities or challenges uh, from cross border e-commerce how can you help retailers to do that better Yeah. Um so I think in every challenge there is definitely an opportunity. Um the things that a lot of our merchants um have faced, I mean again the the pandemic has kind of created um this global customer. I don't think that um American shoppers would ever think to be like importing their toilet paper, but that's become, you know, a norm and as it was at the beginning of the pandemic. So Um I think that the the things that we see as the biggest challenge are first FX rates. So any time that you're accepting currencies from a different country there's um cost and challenges involved there especially in APAC when um many of our currencies regionally are considered exotics. So you're going to want to make sure that you're getting real time conversion rates and that your payments provider is settling in currencies that make sense. So for example if you have settlement currencies um for your Singaporean business in Sing dollars and US dollars and you're also processing um in Indian rupee for example you're going to want to make sure that that's being routed to maybe a Sing dollar settlement as opposed to a USD. Um the other challenge that we have is definitely around acceptance. Um but I will caveat to say that there are some really easy things that you can do to ensure that your you know uh, cross border customers are having a similar payments experience than your domestic customers are um again i think we mentioned a little bit earlier but cross border acceptance rates and conversion rates are much lower than domestic rates so um, you can kind of battle this by one making sure that you're um presenting your customer with the currency that's um local to them so if you have a us based customer you want their checkout experience to be in usd as opposed to sing dollars for example um this also helps with conversion rates uh, local banks like to see transactions in their own currencies um you also want to make sure that you're meeting different banking requirements so the buzz in the industry right now is all around um sca and most european um banks will require um secure customer authentication um with online payment transactions at the end of this year. So you want to make sure that um you're meeting all of the requirements for your international customers in your in your payments experience. Um and then lastly just to kind of echo what Zane was saying, you want to make sure that your website speaks to your local global customer. So is the language accessible for wherever your customer sits? Is there a very clear refund and exchange policies? Um this is super important for US based customers for example where it's much easier to raise a chargeback than it is for um APAC based customers. Um and you want to you also want to make sure that your security is meeting global standards. So every country has different PCI requirements. Um every country has different security requirements for online payment transactions and you want to make sure that um you're adhering to those different nuanced experiences no matter where your customer sits. Great, thank you Ashley. So now I will check with the audience that's launch uh the third poll question is your organization excelling in cross border commerce. And while we are waiting for the poll answer, um I will ask a tool so from retailer's perspective what's your take on cross border commerce? uh okay so i personally don't have uh, much exposure to cross border e-commerce to be honest but uh, i mean from uh, from 
uh, an industry observer perspective, I perhaps can uh, you know add, add a few things. Uh, so yeah, uh, are you seeing a tool again, or it's it's my site. We can hear you okay, uh, Atul. Hi. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so, uh, from a from an industry observer perspective, I think I can uh, you know uh, throw some lights on it. Uh, most of the, I mean, there is there is uh, absolutely you know uh, no gap between what Zen and uh, Ashley added to this, but. Uh, Hi. Are we back online? Something happened. Hello. Hi, can, can you hear me? So um, let's yes. see the result of the third poll. Um, and before we wrap up, it seems like 38% of our audience get some global sales, but could be generating more. So which means it's still at an early stage of cross-border um, commerce, but um, there are a lot of opportunities ahead of us, and uh, maybe in 2021 we should invest more on cross-border commerce. Okay, uh, it seems we don't have a lot of questions from from the audience. Oh, we do have one. Um, so it's for you, Zhang. Um, how has Simpost been using its payments data to navigate its business strategy? How do they differ between consumers and Prices using services. Can you answer that, Zeng? Yes, I can. So I think just one clarification that I want to make is: so Singapore Post e-commerce is an end-to-end -end e e-commerce service provider. We help brands with building their websites, with managing their websites, their commercial strategy, their marketing strategy, their store op strategy, and operations. Uh, with regards, so if it's if you're let's say uh, you know if you're body shop, we would help you build the website, run it build the commercial strategy and execute your revenue ambitions over there. So payment becomes a part of that. So as part of the e-commerce strategy that we do, we look at every aspect of data in terms of where the customers are coming from, what their purchase behaviors are, what uh, channels work better from an ROI and a conversion perspective. And based on that, we tweak the, the marketing dollars that we spend or the, the sort of segmentation strategies that we use, right? So if, for example, we're running the body shop store for Malaysia and Singapore, as an example. And we see that, uh, you know, for Singapore, majority of the orders are coming in from the central part of Singapore. And in Malaysia, majority of the orders are, let's say, coming from the Klang Valley part of it. So based on that, we could come up with different offerings, such as, you know, we could start offering same day delivery, two hour delivery slots for central Singapore, Klang Valley. Uh, we could start doing, uh, you know, other value added services. We could also further segment our audience when we spend money on Facebook or Google to say that I want to spend 70% of my budget targeting uh, these particular geographies or these particular areas uh, with regards to my spend based on I expect a better ROI or ROAS to come in from that. Uh, with respects to other part of data, we look at, uh, you know, we use it to plan our assortment. We use it to plan uh, what we should be selling in a key campaign. So we look at what products are selling, what products are converting at a higher rate, which price points sell the best, 
if you're an apparels brand, we not only look at which SKU is selling well, we also look at which color within that SKU is selling well and which size within that color is selling well. So, you know, if it's a men's T-shirt, the large and the medium might be selling better than the XL and the small. And if it's a women's T-shirt, maybe the XS and the SS is selling better. The black might be selling better than the yellow. The you know So all of these things are what we look at when we decide on the assortment strategy, uh, the replenishments that we ask brands to do, and so on and so forth. And eventually, if you have all the right metrics, it leads to the customers being able to find the product that they're looking for, and thus better conversion, better revenue uh, for the brands on e-commerce. Zane, um, thank you, Ashley, Atul, and Zane joining us for this panel session today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.